Good morning and welcome. Honoring who we have been, embracing who we feel called to be, we come together as an inclusive and diverse community growing in love and truth, courageously collaborating to liberate one another from hurt and hate and create hope and justice. This is our preamble of our Mission Peak Covenant, and each time we meet, we are reminded of our love and our commitment to one another. We ring this bell three times to renew that covenant. The first bell reminds us of our covenant with our forebears who preceded us here on this land and how they honored interdependence with all life and for the earth which sustains us. That was fortunate. The second bell reconnects us with our own best self and the best in one another that we learn to honor the experiences and the wisdom we each bring and to cultivate a deep regard and empathy for one another. And the third calls us into relationship with our children and our children's children out to the seventh generation that we may be reminded that what we do now or what we fail to do will be felt by those who follow us. Be kind to those you meet, for you know not what internal battles are raging. Trauma is pandemic. It lives amongst and betwixt us, and yet it is hidden. We see it not from our vantage point outside. In all its varieties and nuances, simple, complex, historical, community-wide, experienced, observed, it is there. It affects others and ourselves. It remains living within long after the events or past, or so we think they have done. But that person over there looks so normal. Once experienced, we need only be triggered to re-experience without any new event to re-traumatize. Even worse, we may not be aware of its working its will upon us. We think of our feelings being caused by something else and not recognize, sometimes not remember, the trauma that brought us here. It is here intertwined within my bones, your bones. A small example of what it feels like. The Nutritionist by Andrea Gibson. The nutritionist said I should eat root vegetables, said I could get down 13 turnips a day, I would be grounded, rooted, said my head would not keep flying away to where the darkness lives. The psychic told me my heart carries too much weight, said for $20 she'd tell me what to do. I handed her the 20 and she said, stop worrying, darling, you will find a good man soon. The first psychotherapist said I should spend three hours a day sitting in a dark closet with my eyes closed and my ears plugged. I tried it once but couldn't stop thinking about how gay it was to be sitting in the closet. The yogi told me to stretch everything but the truth, said focus on the outbreath, said everyone finds happiness if they can care more about what they can give than what they get. The pharmacist said, clonopin, lamictal, lithium, Xanax. The doctor said an antipsychotic might help me forget what the trauma said. And the trauma said, don't write this poem. Nobody wants to hear you cry about the grief inside your bones. But my bones said, Tyler Clementi dove into the Hudson River convinced he was entirely alone. My bones said, write the poem. We have much work to do. Welcome to a very needed service. 
Please join with me in reciting these words which call us together as a community and with Unitarian Universalists all across the globe. We light this chalice to remind ourselves to treat all people kindly because we are all one family, to take good care of the earth because it is our home, to live lives full of goodness and love because that is how we shall become the best people we can be. Good morning. Welcome to Mission Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation. My name is Colleen Arnold. My pronouns are she, her, or they, and I'm a member of the board. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. Unitarian Universalism is a radically inclusive, non-doctrinal, non-dogmatic, open-minded, and open-hearted faith. We are people who are coming at truth from different paths. We gather together across different identities, experiences, and beliefs to affirm and promote the inherent worth of every person. Together, we see our job is to love the hate out of this world, heal the hurt in ourselves and one another, and to be the change we'd like to see in the world. We use chat in Zoom or our book near the welcome table to share our joys and concerns, personal milestones of importance, which will be read aloud during the service. Maybe you're here for the first time. We've been reaching out and asking people to bring their friends because we think the world, especially now, needs some friendly places to gather and encouragement and hope. We have social hour after the service where we get to visit with one another in breakout rooms or on the patio. The worship host will give you more information about this immediately after the service. In the meantime, we put a link to our weekly newsletter in the chat so you can see all the events coming up. We encourage you to join anything that speaks to you. We also put our welcome email, welcome at mpuuc.org, to request a newsletter or other information to be sent to you. There's a few things we'd like to call your attention to today. Attendees should be masked inside and outside of Cole Hall during the service, preferably with N95 or KN95 masks. We have such masks available at the welcome table in the back. Please help yourself. Eating and drinking are only allowed outside. Now the boutique and auction. We are separating them into two components this year. The boutique will be November 5th, right before the holidays, good timing, and the auction we think will be in February. After service on September 11th, we're going to have a meeting. We'd like everybody to stay online for a brief time so that we can talk about the changes that are happening this year. Now, crafty friends, chefs, we need items for the boutique. Maybe you paint, maybe you make cards, maybe you cook. Um, I personally am making a baby blanket. Huh? Nice colors, right? And I learned this fancy, fancy wavy stitch. It's pretty exciting. Nice and soft yarn. Um, I also do embroidery, so I plan to have that and some of my award-winning fudge. Um, maybe you make salsa. Maybe you jam. Any of those things would be great at the boutique. Please reach out to Suzette, who is organizing pretty much the whole thing. Um, there's also a form, I think, that you would like people to fill out if they have things to donate. And where, is, where can they find that form, Suzette? It's in Week on the Peak. There's a new section for boutique information, and there's a form to be a vendor, and there's a form to donate items to sell Right. And she'll also be calling people uh, looking for things to sell. So this is very exciting. Also, please come to the boutique and buy things. We also have um, a cake. Suzette has brought an example of a cake that she's gonna bring up here so you can see. We're gonna have this vendor at the boutique selling their cakes. Um, it's beautiful. You have to... So come up here so that everybody on Zoom can see it too. Isn't that pretty? Let's see if we could tilt it. Oh, it's gorgeous, look at that, look at the... Strawberry shortcake apparently. Ooh. Full of gluten and sugar. Yum. It looks good. So our cake vendor will be here. And as a special surprise today, we would like the attendees who are in person to look under your chair and see if you have a post-it note there. And if you don't, and nobody has one, then look at some of the other chairs. Because we, 
We didn't know where people were going to be sit sitting, so we didn't know. Who in particular should look around, Suzette? Oh my gosh, it's my husband Greg. That was not, not a plant. So we'll be, we'll be sharing that, obviously, um, because Greg can't eat it, so we'll be sharing it with everybody. It does look delicious. So very excited about that. Um, there's more information on the bulletin board to your left, and then this week on the peak, please silence your electronic devices. Also, we are really in need of some people to help on Sundays. So if you can look online and see where we have people to, uh, to welcome, to set up the chairs and things like that, it's, um, it it's pretty quick. It, we're not doing a whole lot of things right now, but if you could also contact Don Ramey, if you can help him in any way, that would be great. If you hear or see something in this morning's service that inspires you or makes you laugh or brings you hope, please tweet it or share it on social media or just tell a friend. We are trying to start a wave of love and justice with every gathering. Thank you for joining us. thing happened by Margaret Holmes illustrated by Carrie Pio Sherman Smith saw the most terrible thing he was very upset it really scared Sherman to see such a terrible thing Sherman did not like feeling so afraid he did not want to remember what happened so Sherman decided not to think about the terrible thing he saw Sherman thought that would make him feel better. At first, the plan seemed to work. Sherman woke up every morning, he brushed his teeth, and he went to school. Sherman played with his friends, he teased his sister, and he walked his dog. Everything seemed all right for a while, but something inside of Sherman was starting to bother him. Sherman had to play more, run faster, and sing louder in order to forget the terrible thing he saw. Other things started happening to Sherman, too. Sometimes he did not feel hungry. Sometimes his stomach hurt or his head hurt. Sometimes he felt sad, but he did not know why. Sometimes he was nervous for no reason at all. Sometimes he did not sleep very well. Sometimes when he did sleep, he had very bad dreams. The bad dreams scared Sherman. 
All of these things made Sherman angry. It seemed like Sherman was angry all the time. Sherman started getting into trouble at school. Sometimes he felt so angry that he did mean things. Getting into trouble so often made Sherman feel bad. Sherman didn't understand all of his bad feelings. He felt confused. Sometimes parents help children figure out their feelings. Sometimes teachers or other grown-ups help. That is how Sherman met Miss Maple. Miss Maple helped Sherman think about his feelings. She listened while Sherman talked to her. They played while they talked. And Sherman did not feel as mixed up when he talked to Miss Maple. Once when Sherman and Miss Maple were coloring, she told him to draw a picture of how he felt when he was angry. This seemed like a strange thing to draw, but Sherman did it. After that, Sherman drew lots of pictures, pictures of the pain in his stomach, pictures of the bad dreams he had, pictures of the fear he felt. And at last, pictures of the terrible thing he saw. Sherman and Miss Maple talked about the pictures. He asked if the terrible thing he saw was his fault. Sherman said he worried a lot about that. No, Miss Maple told him, it was not your fault. Sherman told Miss Maple a lot of things. He told her about the bad dreams. He told her how scared he felt. It was all very hard to do. Miss Maple was proud that Sherman was trying to talk about such hard things. Sherman found that it felt good to let his feelings out. Feeling good helped Sherman feel stronger. And when Sherman felt stronger, he did not feel so angry. Nothing can change the terrible thing that Sherman saw, but now he does not feel so mean. He is not so scared or worried. His stomach does not hurt as much and the bad dreams hardly ever happen. Sherman Smith is feeling much better now. He just thought you would want to know. We take up a collection on Sundays for the simple reason that our purpose in gathering is for more than ourselves. We want to make sure that the ministries that we need, the ones that infuse worth and dignity into our children, our youth, our programs of learning and leadership, and our ministries of anti-oppression and our work in the larger world are in place to meet the needs of others. It is what makes us who we are. We hope you will make a contribution towards these worthy causes by mailing your check to Mission Peak UU Congregation at the address on the screen. You can also use the bill pay option in your online banking or drop your check in to Mission Peak mail slot or pay online with a credit or debit card. So, thank you for supporting and sustaining the efforts of our members, friends, and staff your contributions make loving, learning, and leadership possible. Thank you. We come together as a inclusive and diverse community growing in love and truth, courageously collaborating to liberate one another from hurt and hate, and to create hope. One of the most important things that we do for one another happens each Sunday. It happens at this part of the service where we stop and we listen to each other. We carefully register one another's joys and sorrows. Sharing these cultivates a tenderness 
please write a brief joy or sorrow in the chat or in the book. And as we speak it aloud, it will be shared and held by the entire community to help remind each of us we are not alone. If you would like to drop a stone, uh, you may do so here in the sanctuary or you can do so at home as well. Uh, and Reverend Barber, myself, and the entire encouragement team is ready to receive phone calls for all those joys and sorrows that are of a more personal nature. are the joys and the sorrows that are alive in this community this week. For all of these concerns, the breadth, the depth, the power of which expand our heart and make us larger and a center of grace and transformation for each of us, we are grateful for this community and the strength it gives us. Amen. Please join with me in the spirit of this reading. The reading this morning is a poem also from Andrea Gibson, who Mark shared a little bit earlier in the call to worship. This poem is called The Madness Vase. To the lamplight considering the riverbed, to the chandelier of your faith hanging by a thread, to every day you cannot get out of bed, to the bullseye of your wrist, to anyone who has ever wanted to die. 
I have been told sometimes the most healing thing we can do is remind ourselves over and over and over, other people feel this too. When you are half finished writing that letter to your mother that says, I swear to God, I tried. But just when I thought I'd hit bottom, it started hitting back. There is no bruise like the bruise. Loneliness kicks into your spine. So let me tell you, I know there are days where it looks like the whole world is dancing in the streets and you are breaking down like the doors of their looted buildings. You are not alone in wondering who will be convicted of the crime of insisting you keep loading your grief into the chamber of your shame? You are not weak just because your heart feels so heavy. I have never met a heavy heart that wasn't also a phone booth with a red cape inside. There are people who will never understand the kind of superpower it takes for some people to just walk outside. I know my smile can look like the gutter of a falling house, but my hands are always holding tight to the ripcord of believing a life can be rich like the soil. What I know about living is the pain is never just ours. Every time I hurt, I know the wound is an echo. So I keep listening for the moment the grief becomes a window when I can see what I couldn't see before, through the glass of my most battered dream, I have watched dandelions lose their mind in the wind, and when they did, they scattered a thousand seeds. So the next time I tell you how easily I come out of my skin, don't try to put me back in. Just say, here we are. And when I'm aching for it to all get better, I know there is a chance my heart may have only just skinned its knees and the worst days may still be ahead. But let me say right now, for the record, I am still going to be here asking this world to dance, even if it keeps stepping on my holy toes. You, you stay here with me. Okay? You, stay here with me. Rising, raising your bite against the bitter dark, your bright longing for brilliant fists of loss. If the only thing we have to gain in staying together is each other, my God, that is plenty. My God, that is enough. My God, that is so, so much more for the light to shine, revealing how each of us has one another's backs, whispering over and over and over, live, live, live. Come. Um.
The 1987 Pulitzer Prize winning book, Beloved, by Toni Morrison, was based on a traumatic moment in the lives of two fugitive slaves, Margaret Garner and her husband. They had barricaded themselves in a small cabin with their three children while being chased by U.S. Marshals. And when the Marshals finally got there and broke into the cabin, they discovered Miss Garner had just killed her two-year-old daughter and was trying to kill her other two children rather than them having to face the horror of being returned to slavery. In the 1998 movie version of the book, Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey played Sethe, based on Margaret Garner's character. That character is depicted in the book as doing penance following that traumatic moment. She ends up caring for the haunted spirit of her daughter who comes back to live with her. It is a story depicting the residual way that trauma can come back, stay, and haunt you. One scene in particular conveys that trauma, but in a real life way not necessarily expected from what Toni Morrison wrote in the book. Oprah's character, Sethe, is called to tuck her daughter into bed. Director Jonathan Demme gave Oprah very minimal instructions for the scene, just saying, tuck your daughter into bed and action. So Oprah circled the bed where the actor playing her daughter lay took the top sheet and folded it down and tucked it in to the side 
and then went around and tucked the other side in. Cut, she heard. No, Oprah, I want you to really tuck your daughter into bed. She nodded. And action, whereupon Oprah, with even greater intention and discipline now, tucked the, part, tucked the sheets, folded them down, and put them into place into all four corners. Cut! Oprah, what are you doing? I'm tucking my daughter into bed, she said with visible embarrassment. No, you're making the bed with your daughter in it, he said. <laughs> and he proceeded to show her how to tenderly caress her daughter using the blankets to create a safe, comforting place for her to sleep. And as he did, the shame rose up in Oprah until she felt a painful epiphany come over her. I don't know what that is, she said. I never had anyone do that for me. Oprah Winfrey was born in rural Mississippi when her teenage mother had one and only one encounter with her father under an old oak tree at the far edge of their property in rural Mississippi. Her father would have never even known of her existence had it not been for a birth amount announcement asking for money and baby clothes. She was raised by her grandmother who practiced corporal punishment because, she said, she loved me. Oprah's life has been a testimony to healing and resilience. There is a reason why she went on to such success, why over a thousand episodes of Oprah's 24 seasons on air explored recovering from trauma, which included dealing with sudden loss or chronic neglect or mistreatment or addiction or sexual abuse or gender identity or false imprisonment and on and on. Oprah understood trauma. She understood the chronic terror and pain that continues long after the actual trauma slips into the past. She understood the countless maladaptive coping strategies that create more problems than they solve. And she eventually came to understand what she calls post-traumatic wisdom, the redemptive insight that comes from our pain. Oprah understands what poet Andrea Gibson meant in the poem that we heard earlier. You are not weak just because your heart feels so heavy. I have never met a heavy heart that wasn't also a phone booth with a red cape inside. There are people who will never understand the kind of superpower it takes for some people just to walk outside. Today's sermon is about trauma, something that we have been hearing a lot about lately. I draw especially from the book released last year by Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry called What Happened to You? Conversations on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing. Dr. Perry has worked with Oprah for about 25 years and is a clinical neurologist with 30 years experience in childhood trauma. He worked with survivors of 9-11 as well as being the lead clinical support for the Branch Davidian complex in the trauma that ensued in Waco, Texas. He's written several previous books on the subject including The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog about the ways love can heal childhood hurt and neglect. Mike Roseman saw a most terrible thing. Mike Roseman was a veteran of the Korean War and had seen lots of combat in his time there, and he returned from Korea with classic PTSD. When he was calm, Mike was smart, funny, and very kind. 
But for 30 years, anxiety, sleep difficulties, depression, and episodic flashbacks replaced calm with a confusion that made it difficult to distinguish between ordinary moments and combat. To cope, he resorted to self-medicating with alcohol, and he struggled with binge drinking. This, of course, contributed to work and family conflicts and ultimately divorce and forced retirement. He needed help healing from the terror he was feeling and from constantly turning toward episodic reoccurring trauma and making it uh, and, and finding a way to transform that into post-traumatic wisdom, resilience, and healing. Mike was working with Dr. Perry, and after a few years, they were making great progress. The binge drinking stopped, the hypervigilance and anxiety became more manageable, but one day, Mike called Dr. Perry, sounding urgent. Can I come in and talk to you today with Sally, he asked. Mike had mentioned Sally in previous sessions. Sally was a retired teacher that he had been dating, about whom he said, I really don't want to blow this one. When they arrived, Mike and Sally sat together. Nervous and uncomfortable, Mike described the date that they had had the night before. After a nice dinner, we were walking downtown on our way to the movies, and suddenly I was in the street between parked cars on my belly with my hands over my head, terrified. I thought we were being shot at. I was pretty confused, I guess. At some point, I realized it was really just a motorcycle backfiring, but for that moment, I was sure it was gunfire. I tore my suit. I was all sweaty. My heart was racing. I was so embarrassed. And afterwards, all I wanted to do was to go home and get drunk. Sally continued. One moment, we were arm in arm. The next, he is back in a foxhole in Korea, screaming. I tried to get down and help him, but he just pushed me away. He hit me. Tell me how to help him. And she turned to Mike. I am not giving up on you. Doc, can you explain PTSD? You know, why I'm all messed up? He started to tear up. Sally took his hand. What's wrong with me? Korea was 30 years ago. Remember the words from the poem. You are not alone in wondering who will be convicted of the crime of insisting that you keep loading your grief into the chamber of your shame. Dr. Perry explained that Mike's brain had biologically adapted to sensory processes, sending life-saving cues that happened sometime in the past. Acting spontaneously to gunfire was at one time real survival. The residue of that deeply ingrained survival response was why Mike flinched at loud noises, constantly scanned the room for sudden movement, and why he had trouble sleeping. Back in Korea, if Mike didn't keep his head down, wasn't vigilant on watch, or fell asleep, he was dead. But he doesn't need it anymore, Sally said. It's actually making his life today miserable. Can't he just unlearn it? Yes, Dr. Perry replied. But the tricky part is that not all of these combat-related memories are in the parts of the brain that Mike can consciously control. At this point, Dr. Perry pulled out a piece of paper and drew an upside-down triangle divided into four parts. It was the first time that he had ever represented the brain this way. We might have a figure of that coming up. 35 years later, it's still the basic model that neurologists use to teach about the brain and stress and trauma. The brain is like a four-layered cake, 
Dr. Perry explained. At the top is the cortex, which is responsible for speech and language, thinking, planning, our values, our beliefs, and perhaps the most important, time. When the cortex is online, engaged, we can think about the past and the present and the future as distinct separate phenomena. But at the bottom of the brain, the brainstem, it controls less complex, more regulatory functions like body temperature, breathing, heart rate. There is no distinction of time. The brainstem cannot tell time. Input from all of our senses, vision, hearing, touch, smell, first enters our brain in the lower areas. No sensory input goes directly to the cortex. The incoming signal is matched against all previously stored experiences to scan records for previous threats. In this case, the motorcycle backfire matched records of gunfire. And since the brainstem can't tell time, it doesn't know that you're not still in Korea. The information about the motorcycle backfire did eventually get to Mike's cortex, but it took a while. Unfortunately, our brain is organized for survival, to feel and act before we think, and that can cause problems. Again, Andrea Gibson. So the next time I tell you how easily I come out of my skin, don't try to put me back in. Just say, here we are. I share this story today because it outlines the way the brain is organized to process information, especially traumatic sensory input that may have a bearing on our survival. But to understand how to heal, how to be more resilient, it's important to understand that when something happens is as important as what happens. When researchers started studying PTSD, which is a relatively new area of study in psychology, they noticed that it tends to occur only in about 15 to 20% of those people who serve in combat. Why not everyone, they wondered. Well, it turns out there was a significant correlation between people who have experienced a previous trauma, such as a violent caregiver or sexual assault or a car accident or a natural disaster early in life, and those who have PTSD severely disrupt their episodes in the future. It's important to note that whereas this is a correlation, not a causation, the stress of previous trauma, especially early trauma, can have a cumulative effect. And a new trauma experience can exacerbate the negative effects of a previous trauma. In fact, how earlier we experience the trauma makes a big difference. One Harvard study showed that when trauma was experienced, that when trauma was experienced can have a more profound influence on a healthy adult functioning than the severity of the experience or the duration of the trauma. It revealed that those who experienced a healthy nurturing environment for the first two years of life followed by 12 year, years in an abusive environment, tended to fare better in avoiding P PTSD than those who were raised in an abusive environment for the first two years, followed by 12 years in a nurturing, responsive environment. Researchers believed the reason can be found in brain development. During the first nine months in utero, development of the brain is explosive, at times reaching a rate of 20,000 new neurons born every second. In comparison, an adult on a good day may create 700 new neurons. By birth, the newborn has 86 billion neurons. These will continue to grow into complex networks allowing the newborn to begin writing new code and making sense of their world. When an infant or young child experiences repeated threat, whether it's hunger or neglect or physical discomfort or pain or inconsistent response for comfort, 
These can be wired into the brain to make them wary. This can be a problem since we are inherently relational and social creatures. We have survived as a species largely because we have adapted toward cooperation with others. Developing resistance or indifference to co that cooperation can become a distinct liability. Dr. Perry likens the growing brain with the building of a house. The fetal brain develops so rapidly, it's like pouring the foundation of a building. The first couple months after you're born is like putting up the framing. The first year, all your interactions with others are adding the wiring and the plumbing of the house. A two-year-old child is not fully developed, but the foundational structures and systems are there, and these will be the basis of all future development. And with a house, if you do a bad job on the foundation, if you put in shoddy wiring and plumbing, but decorate it with beautiful flooring and furniture, all the house may not have the defects as visible when you walk through, but these early construction issues will lead to problems later on. Seeing all the trauma in the world, 80 wars across the planet, refugees fleeing from violence, mass shootings, the pandemic where everyone is wearing a mask, environmental disasters. It's critical that we ask one another about healing. It's common, notes Dr. Perry, for people to laugh nervously and look around and say, well, it sure is good that children are so resilient but he cautions us to understand that both our brains and our children are malleable, not resilient. They don't naturally spring back into their original shape like a Nerf ball. He prefers the analogy of a metal hanger, the kind you use to fish something out of a drain. You may apply force to bend the hanger into a shape that you want because the hanger is malleable. But when the job is done, and when you try and bend it back to its original shape, even if you're a champion hanger bender, you won't get it to exactly what it was. And there will be a weakness in the places where you bent it. And if you keep trying to bend it and restore it, the hanger will eventually break. It's important to remember that the journey from traumatized to typical to resilient to resourceful is nothing new. For thousands and thousands of years, humans lived in small intergenerational groups. There were no mental health clinics, and yet there was plenty of trauma and anxiety and depression and sleep disruptions. But over time, Strategies for healing emerged. Anthropologists believe there are four basic approaches that these societies learned to integrate to heal from trauma. The first, connection to community and clan, to have a tribe and to feel at home in the natural world. Second, re-regulating ourselves to natural rhythms through dance or drumming or song. Third, drawing on the guidance of wisdom from beliefs or values or stories that bring meaning to the randomness or the senselessness of trauma. And four, on occasion, natural hallucinogens or other plant-derived substances facilitated by the guidance of a healer or elder. It is not surprising that today's best practices in trauma treatment are basically versions of these four things. And unfortunately, few modern approaches use all four options well. The current medical model in Western medicine over-focuses on four pharmacology or psychopharmacology and three cognitive behavioral approaches. It greatly undervalues the power of connectedness, our number one option, and rhythm. And yet, if you were to ask Oprah, 
or some of the 37,000 people that she has interviewed over her lifetime about the resiliency from struggle and trauma that they've experienced, you would hear a lot about strategies one and two, especially about community. When I was a child, says Oprah, we used the term weathering. We didn't have a word for the kind of trauma that so many African Americans endured, so we said we weathered. And the church was the big part of how we got through. We weathered together. In those days, church was everything. Your counselor, your nurturer, your comforter, your refuge. The idea of going to therapy wasn't even discussed. If you needed help, you went to church. It was your church family that made sure you had a place to go for Sunday dinner. They were the ones who visited you when you were sick or passed around the plate if you couldn't put food on the table. They helped you hang in there when you were at the end of your rope. And if you ever wonder why, when we come together, we go through the same liturgy in songs and rituals in these worship services, the reason is to invoke the rhythms that are resuscitating, renewing, whether we sing them or speak them, they build resilience and healing and ultimately post-traumatic wisdom. Community is as important today as it was thousands of years ago. The tragedy, however, is that we are becoming more and more isolated and wary of one another. Community is harder and harder to find, so many people are adrift, and yet so many long to feel like they are part of something. There is a direct relationship between a person's degree of social isolation and their risk for physical and mental health problems. I have been told, Andrea Gibson says in her poem, the most healing thing we can do is remind ourselves over and over and over. Other people feel this too. The title of the book behind today's sermon is the key to understanding the message it reveals. Everywhere, the world over, people look out at the maladaptive strategies we practice and ask one another, what's wrong with you? Which is a response based in fear and trauma. The book asks us to take a different tact and to summon love and compassion and ask one another instead, what happened to you? The first thing that we can do is be aware that we all share this pain. But next is the hardest part. Next is the healing. The hardest part is living in a broken world and having to heal ourselves and one another. It is to have faith that there is actually a center that will hold us and to trust that we belong in that center. We deserve healing. Listen to the pulse, feel the rhythm, reach out and call others in. Let's close with the words of Andrea Gibson. Friend, stay here with me, okay? You, stay here with me. If the only thing we have to gain in staying together is each other, my God, that is plenty. My God, that is enough. My God, that is so, so much for the light to shine, revealing how each of us has one another's back, whispering over and over and over. Live, live, live to the glory of life.
So please join with me in reciting these words to extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Friends, reach out with one hand on your heart and one out to the world that longs to connect with you. And remember these words. If the only thing we have to gain staying together is one another, my God, that's plenty. My God, that is enough. My God, that is so much for the light to shine, revealing how each of us has one another's back, whispering over and over and over. Live. Love. Thank you. Amen.